Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to uh, University of Greenwich and to the Pembroke building, building and to the wardroom. Uh, this is the, the first of our lectures uh, in a lecture series from the Faculty of Engineering and Science. Uh, and we're very lucky tonight in that we have uh, Professor John Morton, uh, who's going to talk about, he hasn't put his title up there yet. <laughs> <laughs> he will do in a minute. Right. The International Digital Government Plan on Climate Change, what is it, what it says, and why we should listen. Now, uh, John is a Professor of Development Anthropology at the Natural Resources Institute uh, within the University of Greenwich. I should have perhaps said who I was, and then you perhaps put that in some context. So I'm Andrew Westin, I'm Director of the Natural Resources Institute and the Faculty Director of Research and Enterprise. Uh, so John uh, is a professor within the university, but also head of our livelihoods and institutions department. He's got a BA from, uh, in social anthropology from Cambridge and a PhD from Hull, first study of semi-nomadic pastoralists in northeastern Sudan. After working on that, he worked in various places around the world, including further work in Sudan and Pakistan, and he joined NRI in 1993. Since then, he's worked on a very wide range of topics, from livestock development to pastoralists to numerous other things. But climate change and poor people have been a central part of what he's been doing. So John participated uh, in the IPCC's fourth assessment report between 2004 and 2007, and thus he contributed to the, the, to the receipt of the, of the Nobel Peace Prize in uh, 2007 for the work that the IPCC did. And since that time, since 2010, he served as a coordinating lead author, further up the tree, uh, working on uh, the impact of climate change on rural areas in the fifth assessment report. So John, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much. Yes. So I should say, uh, there will be time for questions afterwards. So if you have any burning questions, then save them up and we'll take them all at the end. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew, for that, that kind introduction. Um, Vice-Chancellor, ladies, gentlemen, colleagues, students, friends, uh, very pleased to be here tonight to talk to you and to uh, uh, examine some of the mysteries around this, this theme, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, uh, not to be confused with the Independent Police Complaints Commission. Um, the IPCC has been very much in the news in the last 12 months. There have been three meetings of governments and scientists in September 2013 in Stockholm, March 2014 in Yokohama, and in April 2014 in Berlin, which approved the release of three successive volumes of the IPCC's fifth assessment report. These presented authoritative evidence on the reality of climate change. They detailed the impacts that climate change will have on nature, people, and society, and they set out options for managing climate risks. There's been some positive reaction and some negative reaction. Um, one side, a broadly supportive news piece from the BBC website on the publication of the first volume, referring to it as a landmark report. And on the other side, a very hostile opinion piece from the Daily Telegraph by a certain Lord Lawson. Uh, the uh, headline is Climate Change, This Is Not Science, It's Mumbo Jumbo. And the conclusion was, it is morally outrageous. It is just as well that the world is unlikely to take the slightest notice of the new IPCC report. Uh, I think it become obvious over the course of the evening which of these two views I incline towards. Um, I was very privileged to lead the drafting of a chapter of the latest IPCC report. And I hope to tell you something about what this mis much misunderstood beast the IPCC is how it reaches its conclusions, and what those conclusions are. Before I go on, I found many people aren't aware of simply quite how large an IPCC assessment report is. I can't show you the fifth assessment report. It's available currently on the web, but only the first volume has been physically published. So I'll show you its predecessor, the fourth assessment report. Volume one, the physical science basis. Volume 2, Impact Adaptation and Vulnerability, and Volume 3, The Mitigation of Climate Change. Approximately 3,000 pages between them, uh, very useful for standing on to change life. 
in the Senate. So what is the IPCC? The first thing to say is that it's not a body made up of scientists, it's a body made up of governments. Uh, 195 governments, so virtually all the independent countries of the world. As a researcher, I have never been a member of the IPCC, I've only ever been an author for the IPCC. It was established in 1988 as a joint initiative of the World Meteorological Organization, WMO, and the United Nations Environmental Programme, UNEP, it was set up in response to pressures from governments and, ironically, considering some of the recent comments, in particular from the US government under Ronald Reagan. They wanted climate change advice from a broad range of scientists in a process that was independent of the existing UN agencies. As a panel of governments, it takes decisions to produce reports, it agrees their structure and their main headings, and it approves the selection of the scientists who will draft those reports. It then approves or accepts, at varying levels of detail, as I'll explain, the reports that are drafted by those scientists. The very complicated procedures that govern the contribution of scientists under the overall oversight of governments have led to some very strong opinions about the IPCC. Many of its critics, from a broadly climate-sceptic viewpoint, have dwelt a lot on the role that governments play. They've been very quick to label it as to label its conclusions as political rather than scientific. Some scientists, on the other hand, have worried publicly that the reports are too conservative and actually play down some of the greatest risks of climate change. But the historian Spencer Weirt, uh, official historian of the American Institute of Physics, has called it a unique hybrid that had, quote, turned its procedural restraints into a virtue. Whatever it did manage to say would have unimpeachable authority, unquote. As I think it will be obvious this evening, I have a lot of sympathy for this position. So, two really important points about the IPCC. Firstly, it does not, except in very special circumstances, commission or carry out original research. It provides a critical assessment of published research. That doesn't mean it summarises everything available or that it fails to distinguish between good and bad research. It puts the owners on the authors to survey the field, to identify the most useful research, assess its strengths and weaknesses, and use it to create a concise account of research on a particular topic. And I'd like to say a bit here about peer-reviewed literature. Many people are under the illusion that IPCC reports are only allowed to use papers that have been published in proper academic journals, what we call peer-reviewed journals. Some critics of the IPCC delight in going through our reference list for reports from governments, reports from development agencies like the World Bank or charities like Oxfam or campaigning bodies like Greenpeace, and then crowing that X or Y percent of our references break the rules. In fact, there is no such rule. Authors are allowed to cite publications not in academic journals, provided they're in the public domain, and provided that they're critically assessed as useful contributions to the research literature. And in some cases, being able to reach beyond the peer-reviewed literature has positive advantages. The biases of research funding mean that formal academic research is often concentrated on the wealthier, more powerful parts of the world and on certain disciplines and topics. Understanding the reality of the lives of the rural poor throughout the world, as we tried to do in our particular chapter, and the way climate change will affect them, is made much easier by drawing on the reports of development agencies and other so-called non-peer-reviewed documents. The second point I've put up here is the mantra that all IPCC authors are urged to meditate on. Our assessment must be policy-relevant, not policy-prescriptive. The IPCC provides policymakers with a review of available knowledge. It does not make recommendations. Another way of looking at this comes from one of the IPCC co-chairs, Otmar Edenhofer. Scientists should be map makers, but it's up to policymakers to act as navigators. The core work of the IPCC is commissioning and overseeing major multi-volume assessment reports. Between its establishment in 1988 and 2007, it produced four of these reports that I've put up on the screen. 
More, most recently, it's produced the fifth assessment report. It's also produced special reports on particular topics, such as on renewable energy sources and on managing the risks of extreme events and disasters. It does most of its work through three working groups. Each working group is responsible for one of the three volumes of an assessment report. With slight changes, the titles of the three working groups have remained constant throughout the five reports, the physical science basis, impacts adaptation and vulnerability, and mitigation of climate change. Each working group has two co-chairs, usually one from a so-called developed country and one from a so-called developing country. The national government of one of the co-chairs funds a small technical support unit, around 10 people, scientists, editors, IT specialists, administrators, to help the process along. Otherwise, it's up to the scientists in that working group. I put here three or five volumes because, in fact, in the new report, the contribution of working group two, my own working group, will now be one volume but in two parts. Hence, this pile would be about a third as tall again. And because there's also a synthesis report which combines findings from all three working groups, for this report cycle, that will be approved and released at the beginning of next month in Copenhagen. I'll say a little bit more about each working group and the key questions that they each seek to answer. The physical science basis. The key questions here, is climate change happening? Are humans responsible? What will the future climate be like? Second working group, impacts, adaptation and vulnerability. The questions we were seeking to answer, what impacts has climate change already had? What impact will it have in the future? And those impacts could be on natural ecosystems, on the economy, on society, on health and on different regions of the world. What factors make people and societies more or less vulnerable to the effects of climate change? How have people adapted and how can they adapt in future? How does climate adaptation relate to sustainable development? In earlier reports, this was the shortest, in many ways the least regarded volume, but it's grown in importance and size and now comprises two volumes, the second on regional aspects, arranged by nine regions of the world. And the third working group, mitigation of climate change. The key questions here. What is the contribution of different sectors of the economy to climate change? What's the options for slowing climate change down? How could these be governed and financed? Unfortunately, in climate change jargon, adaptation and mitigation are separate and mean two different things, and in a sense we have to understand them and live, live with this. Adaptation here refers to adaptations to the effects of climate change such as building sea defences or changing farming practices. Mitigation means addressing the causes of climate change to slow it down, reducing our emissions of greenhouse gases or improving the world's capacity to absorb them, for example, in forests. But more and more we are realising that the two must go hand in hand. The accumulated energy in the world climate system means that the climate will continue to change for 20 or 30 years, even if all carbon emissions stopped overnight. We refer to that as a climate lock-in or a climate commitment. During that time, we will more and more need measures to adapt to the changing climate. We will also need measures to slow climate change down, but in the knowledge that these will have their most important effect after 20 or 30 years, also in the knowledge that the fewer such measures we take and the more slowly we take them, the more the mid-21st century and the late 21st century are likely to suffer from extreme climates and from terrible disruptions. The process of writing the fifth assessment report began with the IPCC plenary in 2008, which decided in principle to prepare the report. <coughs> Detailed outlines or contents lists of each volume were developed and approved by a further plenary in 2009. In the case of Working Group 2, on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability, this included 30 chapters, including the nine regional chapters. The other two volumes have 14 and 16 chapters, respectively. In 2010, governments invited researchers to put themselves forward for nomination to serve as authors. 
In the case of the UK at least, all researchers who nominated themselves to the UK government were in turn nominated by the UK government. There was no filtering. Authors were then selected by the technical support unit and fitted into chapter teams according to their expertise. Most chapters had two coordinating lead authors to lead the process and six other lead authors. Author teams were then approved by a further plenary. Across all three volumes, there were 831 lead authors overall. For working group two alone, there were 1,217 authors nominated, of which 309 were selected as lead authors, coming from 70 countries collected. The map shows in the dark blue countries from which uh, lead authors came, and in the light blue countries that were not represented by lead authors. Um, the lead authors worked in a, a wide range of disciplines across the natural sciences, engineering, economics, the social sciences, and public policy analysis. They were later joined by 436 contributing authors who did not participate in the meetings, but who drafted particular sections based on their specialist expertise. At this point, I'd just like to give a shout out, as they say, for my very talented, dedicated, and international team who work with me on the Rural Areas chapter, my fellow coordinating lead author, Pernamita Dasgupta, and David Barish, uh, Francisco, Marta, Isa, and Catherine. Uh, between us, we represented India, UK, Jamaica, Turkey, Switzerland, Chile, Spain, Senegal, and South Africa. Uh, we were supported by a dozen contributing authors who sent in text on their particular areas of expertise, among which I can single out my colleague Jeremy Hagar in the audience, who contributed uh, his very valuable expertise on the impacts of climate change on coffee, tea, and cocoa. Thank you, Jeremy. Getting down to the nitty-gritty of the process, which is important to understand. It's important to understand the checks and balances that went into drafting this report. Each working group held four lead authors' meetings, uh, in reasonably exotic locations, uh, in the case of Working Group 2, beginning in early 2011. At the first meeting, the chapter team got to know each other, we learned about IPCC procedures, we planned the work, we started to fill in but also to adapt the framework of subject headings that had been given to us by the plenary. Over the next few months and many, many emails, this resulted in what we called a zero-order draft, or ZOD, this was reviewed, mainly by researchers that we suggested ourselves, just to see if we were on, basically on the right track. We met again, we reviewed those comments, and repeated the process with even more emails to produce the first order draft, or FOD. This was open to a much more formal review from anyone in the world who cared to register, uh, large numbers of, of researchers from around the world. At the third meeting, we had to consider these comments extremely carefully, decide exactly how far we would go to accommodate them, and plan the second order draft, which, as some of you will be uh, beginning to realise, we refer to as the SOD. At this point, things got trickier. The SOD is also open to review by national governments as well as by experts. Uh, at our last lead, lead authors meeting, we considered the government and expert comments and we prepared ourselves to produce the final government draft with a deadline in October 2013. At the same time, a subgroup was taking material from all the chapters to produce a summary for policymakers or SPM, which ended up with around 14 pages of text and the same of tables and figures. I don't expect you to read all of that or indeed any of that. It's just a sample and it shows the process we went through. It's a sample of the comments we received, and it shows that we not only had to consider all the comments received from experts and governments, we had to demonstrate we had considered them. They came in in huge spreadsheets, to which we had to add our own column, the far, the, uh, the far right column, of author annotations. So on this slide, we're telling the European Commission and the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, which spoke for the government of China, that to some extent we agreed with their points, we'd worked them into the chapter, but we did not see them as sufficiently important to put them in our chapter summary. We tell the technical support unit that we're now using certain terms of IPCC jargon in a more standard way, 
and we agree with the government of the Netherlands that our coverage of one particular controversial issue has become more balanced. Repeat that around 600 times for our chapter alone. And for the working group two as a whole, we received over the three, re three review rounds 50,492 comments from 1,729 expert reviewers from 84 countries and from 49 national governments. We assessed and then cited over 12,000 references to articles, books and reports. So, uh, last March, uh, the coordinating lead authors arrived in Yokohama for the Working Group 2 plenary. Uh, 105 governments were represented, some of the richest countries in the world and some of the poorest. There's here a very on-the-ball Austrian, two South Sudanese who'd flown from their war-torn country through five different airports to join us, a rather surprised-looking Norwegian, I'm not sure what's happened to him, a very tired Frenchman. I'm not sure whether it's towards the end of the meeting or if he's very bored with what his Finnish colleague is saying. The leader of the UK delegation, your tax dollars at work, uh, and colleagues from Iran and India. Uh, if anybody's wondering why the name boards are all uh, up on end, that's the recognised signal to uh, someone who wants the floor to speak. The normal routine of the meeting was for a sentence of the summary of policy makers to be put up on the, on the huge screens. One or both co-chairs would be on the podium, backed by authors of the relevant chapters, so here is uh, Vicente Barros of Argentina, one of our co-chairs, and there is our NRI colleague John Porter, uh, coordinating lead author of the food security chapter. Governments would ask questions, they'd raise objections, they'd suggest alternative wording. The co-chair and authors would confer among themselves, as, as here, and that's our other co-chair, Chris Field of the USA. Um, an alternative wording would be put on screen, governments would raise more issues, more questions, and so on, till no government in the room disagreed, or at least no government publicly disagreed. The co-chair would gavel the sentence down, he literally, or they, but each literally had a hammer to, uh, to, to uh, pass, pass the sentence into the, into the record, and then we'd go on to the next sentence. Authors not on the podium would sit on the sidelines awaiting their turn few of my colleagues. Government, colleagues uh, government comments varied hugely. In general, I was favourably impressed. Many were genuine requests for clarification of what we meant and what our evidence was to say what we were saying, or they were about making the summary more readable or fine-tuning the language to get the broadest agreement, including the agreement of, the politi of politicians back home that those civil servants had to report to. In the end, any change had to, agree, had to be agreed by the authors. But if there was no agreement, text could be, and in some cases, was dropped. There were two major incidents where the text was fundamentally changed, one in the direction of downplaying the impact of climate change, one actually making the risks of climate change clearer. After five days of negotiation, we had a summary for policymakers. It is available on the web. Uh, as a summary for policy makers of, uh, of each of the other two working groups. We had a summary for policy makers that authors and governments could agree on. Equally importantly, we had the 30 chapters of the underlying report accepted and gathered down. So the big question you'll be asking is, so what did we say? You'll notice I spent a lot of time telling you how, how we got there and why I think this unique combination of scientific review overseen by governments produces reports that are both scientifically accurate and useful for policymakers. But I need now to tell you what we said. So this is my own interpretation of the headlines, using wherever possible summary statements and graphics from the summaries for policymakers of the working groups. I've dwelt much more on material from working group two, with which I'm more familiar, I've tried not to go beyond what is said in the reports. Warming of the climate system is unequivocal. Many of the observed changes are unprecedented. The atmosphere and ocean have warmed, the amounts of snow and ice have diminished, sea level has risen, 
and the concentrations of greenhouse gases have increased. This last point is central. It is, as I'll show in a minute, emissions of carbon dioxide and other gases through human activities such as burning coal and oil that are exacerbating the greenhouse effect and causing global warming. The graphs here show the increase in global average land and sea temperatures since 1850, uh, annual averages at the top, decadal averages at the bottom, clearly a very strong upward curve from about 1900 onwards. Four more graphs showing trends. Um, the first one, decrease in northern hemisphere spring snow cover since 1920, uh, decrease in Arctic summer sea ice since 1900, the increase in heat content of the upper ocean since 1950, and the increase in global average sea level since 1900, all showing trends strongly supportive of the basic thesis of global warming. The next headline, human influence on the climate system is clear. This is evidence from the increasing greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, positive radiative forcing, observed warming and understanding of the climate system. The lines here on these three graphs uh, show observed changes in average land temperatures, land and ocean combined temperatures and ocean heat content. The blue bands represent computer models that have worked only with natural influences on the climate. Uh, changes in solar radiation levels, the blocking effect of volcanic eruptions. The pink bands represent computer models that have worked with these but also with human produced emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. In each case, the pink bands correspond much more closely with the observed changes with the lines. This is true of all regions of the world and it's a very clear indication that a conclusion about human influence on the climate system is fundamentally correct. And continued emissions of greenhouse gases will cause further warming and changes in all components of the climate system. Limiting climate change will require substantial and sustained reductions of greenhouse gas emissions. The graph here shows climate change projected by a range of computer models. 39 models used a scenario of continued high carbon emissions, that's the, the, the brownish band. 32 models used a scenario of rapid and drastic reduction in carbon emissions, that's the blue band. The blue band shows only a small increase in global average temperatures relative to the present. The pink band shows an increase clustering around 4 degrees centigrade, that is a global increase of 4 degrees centigrade, and in some models as high as 5.5 degrees centigrade by the end of the century. Moving on to working group two te territory, the impact of climate change, this map shows impacts that have already been observed, but observed in the scientific literature. This is the result of an exercise using strict criteria to identify impacts that can be robustly attributed to climate change beyond the contribution of other processes. Impacts include, you guess from the, uh, from the icons, changes in snow cover, surface water availability, natural ecosystems, agriculture, economic activities. Where they're solid, it means that climate change has made a major contribution. Where they're outlined, the contribution of climate change has been minor. And the number of bars next to each icon um, represents the confidence that that particular chapter team had in the climate change contribution. The conclusion is that observed <coughs> impacts of climate change are widespread and substantial. In many ways, many important ways, this map and the relevant chapter of the report strongly underestimate the impacts we can observe. Firstly, it's easier in this sort of exercise to attribute impact on natural systems such as glaciers or species distribution uh, to climate change than it is to attribute impact on human activities and human welfare. Secondly, attributing individual extreme weather events like droughts, storms or floods and therefore the impact of those event, uh, events to climate change is a very difficult, analytically difficult task 
but research on how to do it is progressing all the time and has progressed since we started writing that report. Many important impacts that are strongly felt and that we can in various ways assume are effects of climate change have been excluded from this map because they've not been demonstrated in the scientific literature. This is especially true of poorer parts of the world like Africa. This graph shows one particular class of observed impacts on crop yields. It shows the way climate change has affected yields of the major crops since 1960. It's based on a computer analysis of what would have happened to world crop yields without climate change, but with the same advances we've had in agricultural technology. So it's an analysis against a counterfactual. We can see here the strongly negative effects on maize and wheat yields. The, the, last, the first and the last column. This holds true for many regions and as a global aggregate. Um, we argued for a long time about how well this slide works, uh, but it did go into the technical summary uh, of, of working group two. Um, the headline is that people, societies and ecosystems in poor and rich countries around the world are vulnerable and exposed to climate change in different ways. The different strands of inequality from which people suffer, inequalities of gender, wealth, ethnicity, age, disability, are woven together to make people more or less privileged on the left-hand side of the graph or more or less marginalised on the right-hand side. In general, the more privileged have greater opportunities and are less likely to be vulnerable to the effects of climate change. The more marginalised have fewer opportunities and are more likely to be vulnerable. But the choices we make as a society, this is the downward grey arrow, and the responses we've already made to climate change may change that mix. Um, up to now, I've desperately tried to avoid the academic habit of giving you slides with huge amounts of text on, but when I got to this point, I really had to um, succumb to temptation. Working Group 2 identified eight cross-cutting categories of risk presented by future and current climate change as key risks. These are slightly condensed versions of six of them. Risk of death, injury, ill health, or disrupted livelihoods in coastal zones. <clears throat> risk of flooding for large urban populations. Risk posed by extreme weather events to infrastructure networks and critical services. Risk of extreme heat waves, particularly for vulnerable urban populations and for those working outdoors. <clears throat> risk of loss of ecosystems at sea, in coastal <clears throat> regions, on land and in fresh water and loss of the support they provide for livelihoods. I'll now say a bit about the risks to food security and to rural areas, which were the other two of the eight, which were subjects covered in chapters that I and my NRI colleague, John Porter, were involved in. Food security, food production systems. There are a lot of different projections in the literature of crop yields, some positive, some negative. But for temperature increases of two degrees centigrade or more, uh, yields of wheat, rice and maize are projected to decline and they're projected to decline strongly after 2050. There will also be increased variability of yields between years. There are opportunities for adapting farming practices, but these opportunities are variable, patchy, they're greater for temperate regions than for tropical regions and the higher the level of warming, the less important, the less effective they will be. Projected changes in world food prices are very sensitive to the particular models that researchers use and what factors they include. Some estimates for world food price increases run as high as an 84% increase in real terms by 2050. A conclusion is that global temperature increases of 4 degrees centigrade or more, combined with world demand for food, which we know is rising at around 14% per decade, would pose large risks to food security globally and regionally, in rural and urban areas, and especially in developing countries. <clears throat>
Rural areas. Rural areas are not just about growing crops and they're not just about growing the staple crops. They will suffer multiple compound and complex impacts. There'll be changes in yield and, and also in the areas fit for production of both food and non-food crops. Coffee being a very good example of a, a non-food crop which is important to the livelihoods of millions of people. There'll be impacts on livestock. Uh, the only picture here that I took myself is the middle one of a piranha pasture is desperately trying to hold up a cow that is about to die from the effects of drought. Uh, there'll be impacts going through incomes and prices because many people in rural areas have to buy their food. There'll be impacts on water availability, water supply, and there'll be impacts through infrastructure. These will all be experienced in an overall context of vulnerability which includes remoteness from decision-making. By and large, rural people are less able to access the corridors of power. And these impacts will dis disproportionately affect the welfare of the poor, who are under marginalized, and categories such as female-headed households, and people that have limited access to land, limited access to modern agricultural inputs, to infrastructure, and to education. There are adaptations that are possible in the field of agriculture, water, forestry and biodiversity. And these can occur through policies that take a real account of how decisions are, make, uh, uh, how decisions are made in rural areas and by whom. So uh, the last uh, of the pictures is of a researcher actually talking to people and trying to map their concerns. For Europe, these, this is uh, one table from the Working Group 2 Summary for Policymakers that shows key risks for Europe, including the UK. Uh, the risks given are essentially risks of floods to people and, and property all over Europe. That's the, the, first, the first row. Risks of drought and water restrictions, particularly in southern Europe. And risks of extreme heat events, heat waves, to the economy in general, to agriculture, to people's health and productivity all over Europe and specifically manifesting in wildfires in southern Europe and Russia. The second column shows, I won't list them, some of the opportunities we have for adapting to those risks. The last column shows, and here it really gets quite complicated, how high these risks are rated for the present, for the period 2030 to 2040, and for the end of the century in lower carbon and in higher carbon scenarios. The strike bars show the rating without adaptation. The solid bars show the risks even with adaptation. You'll see that while flood risks um, can be strongly reduced with adaptation, if you look at the solid bar, it's really quite low. Long-term risks of drought and damage to, uh, due to extreme heat events, the second and third rows, remain medium to high even with adaptation. These risks are relative to scenarios of carbon emissions. You can't talk about these risks without talking about the different futures that we make for ourselves by different behaviours in terms of the greenhouse gases we emit. This graph shows high and low emission scenarios for global temperatures. It's actually pretty much the same as I showed a few slides, a slides ago and also what we call a burning embers diagram for five different categories of risk. So a low emission scenario here, if you take it across horizontally, um, keeps most of these risks in an orange or moderate category. The higher emission scenarios up here, if you take it across horizontally, uh, puts several sorts of risks, particularly risks to unique and threatened ecosystems, and what's labelled here as distributional impacts, which really means increased poverty and reduced well-being for the poor, it puts those risks into the purple or black very high category. Moving on now to working group three <coughs> conclusions, greenhouse gas emissions accelerate despite reduction efforts. Most emission growth is in carbon dioxide from fossil fuel use and industry. This graph shows the importance of drastic, rapid and front-loaded action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It shows the steady increase in world carbon emissions 
from 1970 onwards, even while politicians were talking and reaching agreements about emissions reduction. There's been an increase of over 60% between 1970 and the present. The orange area represents the use of fossil fuels and other industrial processes. The red is CO2 emissions from land use, including agriculture and deforestation. The pale blue is methane, produced mainly from agriculture and livestock production, and the other two bands are minor greenhouse gases. The total is inexorably rising. About half of the cumulative total of greenhouse gas emissions since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in 1750 have occurred in the last 40 years. Mitigation requires major technological and institutional changes, including the upscaling of low and zero carbon energy. This graph shows the enormous effort we need to reduce carbon emissions. Each graph shows a best estimate of the share of low carbon technologies in total energy use required at various stages of the century to meet certain specified targets for CO2 levels in the atmosphere. The right hand graph um, is based on maintaining carbon levels in the atmosphere virtually unchanged and it requires growth in low carbon energy use between now and 2050 of over 300%. Even the left hand graph, which is by no means a worst case scenario, requires an increase in low carbon energy use of 190% between now and 2050. Mitigation measures such as conversion to renewable energy resources will have to be rapid and front-loaded. Working Group 3 concludes that the current political commitments by world leaders, the Cancun pledges as they're known, are not consistent with limiting an average temperature increase to 2 degrees centigrade, which is widely acknowledged as a sort of threshold beyond which things get very dangerous indeed. We need a next level of effort now to limit emissions by 2030 and leave us with a chance of limiting the total increase to 2 degrees <coughs> centigrade. Responding to climate change is about managing risk, acting with the best information we have in the face of something that is intrinsically uncertain and variable. As I mentioned earlier, we have energy already locked into the climate system and we would experience climate change for 20 or 30 years, even if all greenhouse gas emissions stop tomorrow. For this reason, we need both mitigation and adaptation. They're complementary. Adaptation will be vital now and later. Mitigation is vital now and will benefit us later. The sooner and the more radically we act, the more we will reduce future risks. Another way of putting this is that without mitigation now, we risk coming up against some very hard limits to the amount we can adapt. Adaptation to climate change is already happening. It's happening at the level of individuals and households, such as the farming households I work with in developing countries. It's happening at community level, at the level of private companies, and the level uh, of different sorts of government, local and national. Much adaptation is driven and will continue to be driven by present climate extremes and experienced climate variation rather than by an abstract prospect of longer term climate change. But that is very much a part of managing risk. Adaptation is going to have to be very specific to places and to contexts. There are very few blueprints. Adaptation depends on understanding context. And it will demand complementary action at all the different levels from that of individuals to that of laws and policies. In my own field, we see how important it is to appreciate what farmers are doing now to adapt, but also to ensure that they're supported with information, with functioning markets, and with favorable policies. In fact, many, maybe most of the most important things we need to do for adaptation are things we should be doing anyway. In the jargon, these are referred to as co-benefits of adaptation. But they refer to something very important, reducing people's vulnerability by letting them become better educated, 
healthier, less poor, and more involved in making decisions about their own lives. With which I'll move on to my last slide. Uh, you'll see in a minute, the man on the podium is listing the co-benefits of climate change action. Personally, I think we can tackle climate change and build a better world. Thank you all very much.